Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, 64th series of the Menno Simons Lectures here at Bethel College. I'm John Thiessen, archivist and co-director of libraries here and currently chair of the committee that puts together the lecture series. The Menno Simons Lecture Series began in 1953 with Roland Bainton as the first lecturer, and it's now about half as old as the college itself. It's funded by an endowment provided by the Kaufman and Yankee families, as you can read in the, the printed brochure. If you look at the li list of past lectures in the brochure, you can see that there are several um, broad themes that we cycle through over the years. Reformation and 16th century studies, theological topics, literary topics. This year, we're returning to the theme of more recent church history. Our speaker, Perry Bush, is professor of history at Bluffton University and also a politician and also a Southern Californian originally. Uh, he graduated from University of California, Berkeley, and from Carnegie Mellon University. His books that you and this audience are most likely to have read would be Two Kingdoms, Two Loyalties, Mennonite Pacifism in Modern America, and uh, Dancing with the Kabzar, Bluffton College, and Mennonite Higher Education, and then the most recent one, just from last year, Peace, Progress, and the Professor, the Mennonite History of C. Henry Smith. Tomorrow evening we'll have a book table and a, a reception after the evening lecture, and uh, at least the C. Henry Smith's, Smith book should be available, maybe the others also. Um, it seems to me that it's somewhat rare to look at Mennonite history through the lens of economics, uh, class maybe, uh, those kinds of questions. And I think at least to some extent in this lecture series that we're starting this evening, we have a chance to hear some of those kinds of questions. Welcome here to Bethel Barry, Perry, and we'll look forward to hearing what you have to tell us this evening. Good evening. I am uh, delighted to be here. Thank you, John, for that introduction. It's better than I deserve. You know, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here delivering the Menno Simons Lectures at Bethel. It's a real honor. I know that I've been preceded in this role by a, a long line, thank you, Mark, a long parade of eminent scholars and church leaders. And it's hard, actually, for me to envision myself keeping that kind of academic company, I'll admit. Um, and I don't, I don't know what else to do but do what we Mennonite historians do. In other, in other words, tonight and tomorrow morning and tomorrow night, I'm just going to try to present to you a few more elements of a usable past. And by itself, that, that agenda should not occasion any kind of great alarm, certainly not in the world of Mennonite historical scholarship and certainly not here at Bethel College. If you define a usable past as simply an interpretation of the past that can be of, that can be of service to the present, then my lectures here are more just another expression, if in type, though probably not in quality, of the same enterprise that began with scholarly giants like C. Cornelius Weidel and C. Henry Smith and were further developed in the capable hands of H.S. Bender and Edmund Kaufman and Guy Hirschberger and found expression more recently in marvelously talented historians and church leaders like Robert Kreider, who I wish was here and Theron Schlaubach, and Beulah Hostetler, and Rod Zawoski, and Keith Sprunger, and Jim Yonke, and Rachel Waltner Gosen. Those are, those are my colleagues in this usable past. Their, their work was sound scholarship in itself, was, but in the end, of course, it was ultimately designed to serve the church, and it did. Their books and articles helped the church address the crises of its day and respond accordingly. And if what I do tonight and tomorrow will make a few contributions on those same lines, I will be satisfied with my trip out here. So with that agenda in mind, I want to I wanna address uh, Mennonite responses to social and economic injustice in the 20th century US, working primarily through the lens of history. Uh, to do this, I want to take a central problem of our time, the inescapable and massive chasm of economic inequality, <clears throat> 
and then work backwards. The fact that American income inequality has widened to Grand Canyon dimensions over the past three decades seems to be inescapable, though this recognition seems to have entered our political dialogue uh, and our political considerations just now recently. A number of scholars have documented, fully documented, that particularly at the quarter century after World War II, income inequality actually narrowed in America. The middle class grew remarkably, poverty rates declined, median family incomes rose across the board and even came to include people of color, people traditionally relegated to the economic margins by the force of American racism. These economic equalizing trends came to a halt in the early to mid 1970s and since then we've witnessed their steady reversal. What has followed now has been about a 40 year period in which most Americans have seen their wages either increase slightly or stagnate and a disproportionate chunk of the national wealth flow upwards to the top, very top levels of the economy. By the turn of the 21st century, writes a labor historian Nelson Lichtenstein, quote, real household income for young families, which is to say breadwinners under 30, stood at one third less than their counterparts in 1973, even though their total working hours were longer and the educational level of, level of head of households higher than a generation before, unquote. Levels of economic inequality did lessen briefly in the Great Recession of 2008-2009, only because incomes of nearly all Americans took a hit in those years. But they've, they've accelerated since then, with a vast percentage of incomes gains concentrated as before at the very top levels of the economy. In the three years, for instance, from 2009-2012, people in the top 1% of income brackets saw their real incomes rise by 31% while the rest of us in the bottom 99% enjoyed a rise of less than half a point in our income levels. And, you know, we do, actually, we do seem to be witnessing, finally, a delayed political reaction to those developments. As America, Americans, pollsters and commentators tell us today, can tolerate remarkably high levels of income inequality as long as they perceive that access to wealth remains widespread. In other words, and this is of course something I was preaching about this morning here at Bethel College Mennonite Church. All of us cherish a firm conception of America as a meritocracy, as a place where all of us are free to rise as far as our talents and capacity for hard work will take us. And it's only when Americans perceive that access to economic, excuse me, access to upper mobility is threatened that they take to the streets, or at least they take to the voting booth. We'll see next week. At two other periods in our national history, the political commentator Kevin Phillips tells us, we saw profound eras of wealth concentration in the Gilded Age economy of the robber barons in the latter part of the 19th century and then also again in the 1920s. And both were followed by periods of widespread political protest and then by periods of reform, the populist progressive eras and then the New Deal uh, respectively. And in those eras, Americans checked those concentrations of wealth and took measures to address the needs of people that those periods had left out. And in this light, the lack of response, political response, to the rising wealth inequalities of our day, I will admit, for me, has been terribly puzzling. If a disproportionate percentage of the national wealth is flowing upwards to the top 1%, I have per periodically wondered aloud to my students over the past two decades, then where's the protest? Why are people so acquiescent to this? Well, I don't know how else to read the recent populist surges on both the left and right of the American political spectrum, the millions of Bernie Sanders voters on one hand and the rise of Donald Trump on the right, except as evidence that this political response may finally and belatedly be at hand. What may be driving people into political expressions of deep-seated economic rage may well be, in part, the, the growing sense that our national political and social community may be fragmenting now beyond repair, that the social bonds that once held us together as Americans are coming apart. In other words, we might be witnessing a declining commitment to safeguarding what activists, scholars, and political theorists for the past centuries once referred to in shorthand as the common good, the common good. A number of scholars, 
have documented the growing and pervasive sense of self-centered individualism that seems to be metastasizing across the country. You all are, are familiar with these, and these analyses have been around now for decades. Robert Bella and his team of researchers, Habits of the Heart, documented that. But I've been moved, in particular, by the analyses of the Harvard sociologist Robert Putnam. In his monumental work 16 years ago, Bowling Alone, the Collapse and Revival of American Community, Putnam exhaustively documented the declining bonds of what the what sociolo sociologists call in shorthand as social capital, the social capital that once held Americans together. And he followed this up with an equally important study released just this last year titled Our Kids, the American Dream in Crisis. I don't know if any of you know that book. I've been using it actually in a gen ed course I teach. And it just asks the students, I mean, it sets up for me to ask, it talks about what's happened to our sense of shared community. And particularly, why is it that some people are escaping these traps of economic inequality and some people are not? And, and Putnam lays out a, a uh, remarkable argument. He begins, of course, by detailing the growing wealth inequalities of American, gro growing wealth inequalities of contemporary America. But the power of the work is in Putnam's documentation that all Americans are not suffering its effects equally. In fact, he posits the simultaneous existence of two Americas. One of them is made up of people, I'll, I'll hazard a guess here, made up of people like most of us in this room. He, he acknowledges, Putnam acknowledges, that in a country still deeply shaped by the poisons of racial and ethnic prejudice, that race and ethnicity still matter, they still matter very much. But the real dividing line between these two Americas is not so much racial or ethnic as it is today, as it is one of social class. And a class division, he says, that is profoundly shaped by access to one major thing, access to education. People with bachelor's degrees or above live in a very different country than people without them. Overwhelmingly, people like us, I'm hazarding a guess, but I suspect most of us would fall into this category. People with bachelor's degrees or above live in a very different country. We, we tend to enjoy at least some measure of economic security, especially those of us who are older and not uh, crippled by massive student loan debts. You know, the, the, the taxpayers of the state of California subsidize my education. And I, don't, I, I, I tell students this, in part because I'm an activist at heart. I tell them when I paid to go to Cal, tuition. I paid $800 a year to go to, to go to Berkeley, you know, in 19, in the late 70s. I graduated in 81. And of course, the taxpayers were subsidizing my education, and they, they quit doing that after Prop 13. By any number of measures of familial stability, relatively low rates of divorce, out of wedlock births, us middle class educated Americans live ordered and productive lives. The economic goods of the country still tend to come our way. By contrast, those people in the second other America, and of course Michael Harrington's magic phrase still works, are very much the opposite. Their lack of access to education has largely kept the doors of economic security locked or severely diminished. They scramble out lives marked by economic instability and family dysfunction, higher rates of divorce, and high rates of out of wedlock childbirth. To choose just one statistic, Putnam points out that in the quarter century between 1989 and 2013, the net worth of college educated Americans with children rose 47%, and while those with only a high school education declined by 17%. That's the big gap. And increasingly, here's the key point, Putnam argues that the channels of influence or even interaction between these two Americas seems to be diminishing. Fewer people in the middle class educated in America live near or even know people from the second less, less educated other half. The traditional spheres of interaction that used to transcend social class boundaries, common neighborhoods, shared churches, other religious bodies, sports teams, civic groups, those, those spheres of interaction are either declining or operating in ways that diminish cross-class collaboration. The ties that used to hold us together, the bonds of commitment to a common good, seem to be eroding. And again, you know, I, I live in such a, well, you know what I do for a living. It's not like I live in immense, you know, wealth. I'm a Bluffton College professor, Bluffton University professor. But I, every so often, get these shocking reminders of, of your own privilege. 
Um, I remember I, we, we had to, uh, I had to travel and our, one of our carry-on suitcases got lost. And so I had to go to Goodwill and get a new carry-on suitcase. So I found one that would work and I plopped it on the desk at Goodwill. And I asked this woman that's behind the counter, I said, you think this would, is this too big, will it work as a carry-on? And she said, I don't know. I've never flown, she said. And for me, that's when you fly. That's what you do. There's, there's even emerging evidence now that people in the second America pay a price in terms of how long they can expect to live. Some of you I saw, saw, I expect, that study that came out last fall by the Princeton economists Angus Deaton and Ann Case, documenting the skyrocketing mortality rates among the lower educated, middle class, working class, particularly rural whites. Now, the mortality rates for African Americans and Latino Americans are still higher than, it is, than they are for rural whites. But, the, but what these uh, demographers documented is that for African Americans, for Latinos, the, the mortality rates are declining. Whereas for rural, lower class, lower educated white people, they're in fact going up, drastically going up. And we can point to some, some um, causes why the opioid, opioid epidemic, lung cancer, alcohol consumption, suicide. I mean, it's, these, are, these are life and death decisions. And of course, it's these Americans, initial evidence suggests, who may have been moved politically by the explicit race-based resentments articulated by Donald Trump. And I, all we've got so far is journalists working at that, but I, like the rest of you, I'm paying careful attention to American, you know, the reports of American journalists and the initial studies and that seems to be what's propelling him. He is speaking to that rage. Well, of course, things don't have to be this way, at least not if the past is a guide. When we turn from areas like sociology, economics, and politics to the field of history, it's clear that things haven't always been this way. You know, by, by heart and by training, I am a, I'm a social historian, I'm a narrative historian. I just like to tell good stories, and uh, that's what I do best. So I'm just going to tell a few stories, a few places and times in America when, the, when various of our historical predecessors refused to accept the fragmenting of the ties that held their society together. Some Americans have refused to withdraw into comfortable socioeconomic or religious islands and have moved to reinforce the common good. And one of the most effective and enduring ways they did this was through politics. It's not the only way to preserve the common good, but it is a major way. Now, I, I got to talk briefly about where this comes from and, and ways it's been shaped. The common good is an old, old idea in America. In fact, it goes way back in the history of kind of Western Europe. You could read bread riots or food riots. Of George Ruday and other historians have talked about food riots as a way of, of maintaining the common good. When, when, a, when an entrepreneur gathers up all the bread from a rural European community to sell overseas or to ship elsewhere, oftentimes what would happen is there'd be a food riot. And even the word itself, riot, was a, was a, was a smear. What people would do, I mean, the, the, guy, the idea was this person in doing that was violating an older community standard that said you put the good of the community over your own individual striving. These are features of Western urban landscapes that go back hundreds of years. We saw them in our own country, and certainly in colonial America, we saw bread riots happening in the Confederacy as late as 1862. The idea was you couldn't sell your bread, your wheat meal, your corn meal, or whatever the market will bear. You have an obligation to sell that to the community at a price the poor could afford. And so oftentimes, the village elders, the town elders set the price of that wheat meal. And so what people would do is they would grab the bread, they would disable the rudder of the ship, they would take the stuff, they wouldn't just dump it or steal it, they would in fact sell it at what was called the just price, a just price, right? Was, and oftentimes, urban officials would look the other way because this person had violated an older community standard in which you put the good of the community over individual striving. This is a long-standing pattern in the West. And the, the, uh, the American project had only barely gotten underway before some of our founders began to reshape it. Take, for instance, the reasoning of James Madison in Federalist Number 10. All right? The Federalist Papers, surely you remember, 
were, were arguments, actually newspaper columns, uh, put out by uh, proponents of a, of a charter of a new government they were posing. They're going to they're gonna put a new, a char they're going to charter a new government, and of course we call that government the U.S. Constitution. So in, in the Federalist Papers, in Federalist Number 10, Madison set out another argument on behalf of this new proposed Constitution by, by addressing a major issue that they had to figure out, and he called this the mischiefs of faction, the mischiefs of faction. Today we wouldn't use this terminology, what Madison called factions, we call self-interest. So what Madison addressed in Federalist Number 10 was really one of the major questions in contemporary U.S. politics. What do we do about the question? What do we do about the issue of self-interest in politics? Now listen to Madison. He says, quote, there are two ways of curing the mischiefs of faction, he said. The one by removing its causes, the other by controlling its effects, unquote. And both methods, he said, are faulty. The only way to control the effects of self-interest the effects of factions, he said, would be somehow to destroy the natural diversity in American society, to give, quote, to every citizen the same opinions, the same passions, and the same interests, unquote. And you couldn't do that. I mean, he was trying to put the country together of 13 squabbling little independent countries going from the backwoods of Massachusetts to the rice swamps of, of Georgia coast, right? And you couldn't give them all the same interests. Trying to cure the causes of faction, he says, was even worse. If we were trying to remove the causes of faction, he said, we would do so by, quote, and I love this quote. My students read Fellows Number 10 in U.S. History Surveys every semester. We would do so by destroying the liberty which is essential to its existence. It could never more truly be said than of the first remedy that it was worse than the disease. This is great stuff. Liberty is to faction what air is to fire, an ailment without which it instantly expires. But it could not be less folly to abolish liberty, which is essential to political life because it nourishes faction, than it, would be why, than it would be to wish the annihilation of air. So what are we to do? Madison only had one solution. If we're going to free, be a free people, he said, we're going to have liberty. Let's just admit that we're going to have factions. We're going to have self-interest in politics. And of course, then it followed, and he develops this argument in Federalist Number 10 and others of the arguments in those newspaper columns. The only solution to this problem is to create a large central government capable of adjudicating among the clash of conflicting groups. The common good, says Madison, is only a little more than the accumulation of all our own individual self-interest. Well, you know, in some ways, Madison won today. In some ways, what he laid out in Federalist Number 10 formed a fundamental rationale for modern American politics. But he also did obscure and override an older idea, an idea that has not entirely vanished, that there isn't just our, our own individual self-interest, that there is a common good that's bigger than any of us, and that it needs to be safeguarded and protected if it's going to endure. And if we jump ahead about 150 years, it's even possible to catch some echoes of this older idea reverberating through the course of subsequent American politics. Take, for instance, a remark that Franklin Roosevelt made to an important member of his cabinet. He said, we, I'm quoting him, we are going to make a country, he said, in which no one is left out, unquote. We're going to make a country in which no one is left out. Oh, then to, to illustrate this, for a practical application of this commitment to the common good, I'll offer up a little story. One so deeply rooted in American labor history that it has it's become almost mythic, almost a parable, all right? And let me set the stage for this. We've got to go back now 100 years when millions of Americans had very few safeguards in terms of the working conditions, hours, or safety regulations where they labored their lives away. Unskilled workers commonly labored 60 to 80 hours a week for levels of pay they could not support their families on. In Carnegie's steel mills, Carnegie had two shifts, you know, what was it, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m.? Had the day turn, the night turn, so he'd work 12 hours a day. And then one, twice a month, one day, you know, they, they would switch it every other week. So, so um, one day or every week, one day they would, they, you would, you would uh, have 24 hours off in a row. And, of course, the next time when you shifted, you'd go 24 hours straight making steel. And, of course, you couldn't feed your families on that, so what people would do is spouses and children, wives and children entered the workforce as well in workplace environments that were profoundly unsafe. 
And this, again, resulted in statistics that are staggering. They're staggering today. As late as 1911, about 100 Americans were killed at their workplaces every day. 100 Americans were killed every day of the year. Uh, 6,000 Americans died in the road industry alone. Uh, industrial accident was a leading cause of death for young men. Oh, to combat these, tr these conditions, working people seized upon what means they had for redress. And most commonly, this meant they went on strike. Well, let me be more specific now with the context. Let's go specifically to the garment district in New York City, right, where conditions were especially ripe for a strike. Hundreds of thousands of women, many of them immigrants from places like Poland, Russia, Ukraine, and Italy, were hunched over sewing machines 12 hours a day in lofts or in basement factories making something called shirtwaists, which were blouses that worn by women, millions of shirtwaists. They were fined if they broke needles or if they talked too loudly. When they went to the restroom, they had a matron timing them. Many were sexually harassed. So they pushed their employers for a shorter workday, for better working conditions, for better pay. And when, employ and when employers resisted, they struck. In 1909, there were 20,000 of these women garment workers walking picket lines in New York City and talking union. Well, the shirtwaist kings, their employers, were led by two leaders in particular, uh, two shirtwaists, and these were guys who had risen up from garment workers and out to factory owners, Max Blank and Isaac Harris. And some of you know where this is going because, again, this has become almost, almost iconic in American labor history. And they were owners of a large firm called the Triangle Shirtwaist Company. And they responded with their favorite weapons. They called in local municipal authorities to help break the strike. And specifically in the context of New York City in 1909, they called in the aid of the Democratic Party of New York City. And this was an outfit which back then was more popular, popularly known as, of course, Tammany Hall. Again, I, I'm assuming that for many of you, your US history survey classes have receded now in, in distant memory, but I'll, so I'll give you a, a reminder. Um, Tammany Hall was the greatest political machine in American history. It was an immense political bureaucracy devoted to two things, winning elections and then rewarding your supporters with the spoils, jobs, and lucrative insider con contracts. It had a well-deserved reputation for political corruption. The bosses of Tammany Hall, like Richard Croker, George Washington Plunkett, and Charles Murphy, became immensely wealthy men. And under their leadership, Tammany Hall, by and large, took the side of the economic forces pursuing their narrow self-interest in New York City. In most strikes, for instance, it cooperated with local manufacturers in putting them down, and it certainly did that in 1909. Tammany's policemen beat the shirtwaist strikers and hauled them off to jail. A few firms caved, smaller firms caved, and made some small concessions to their workers. But most of the shirtwaist kings, led by Blank and Harris, fought off the unions, and slowly the strikers drifted back to work with few or no gains. Well, what it took to change these dynamics was one of the great workplace tragedies in American history. Late in the afternoon, on Saturday afternoon, March 25, 1911, hundreds of people were finishing up their work day at the Blank and Harris Triangle Shirtwaist Company near Washington Square in Lower Manhattan. And these workers were mostly immigrant women. They were working with highly flammable materials in a factory operating with little safety equipment, and they were doing, on, doing it on the eighth to 10th floors of a high-rise factory in a city where fire department ladders only went six stories in the air. And late in the day, as these tired women rushed to finish up a long work week, and as the sidewalks outside were busing with thousands of people already enjoying the weekend, a small fire broke out in a waste can. And within minutes, the eighth floor was ablaze and the flames were shooting upwards. Panicked people rushed for the fire escape doors, but Blank and Harris kept them locked to avoid worker pilfering of supplies. So they rushed for the one remaining freight elevator and they rushed for the roof. So many people pushed onto the fire escape, and it, that only went about, uh, uh, didn't, didn't go all the way ground, went, went up within two stories of the ground. They rushed for the fire escape that it broke away from the building and plunged dozens of people to their deaths. Within 10 minutes, 146 people were burned alive in view of the full view of thousands of horrified onlookers there in Washington Square on a Saturday afternoon in the spring. Well, one of those onlookers was a 30-year-old social worker, very cultured, elite young woman, graduate from Mount Holyoke, 
deeply compassionate Christian, social gospeler, 30-year-old social worker. She was having tea nearby with a friend on a Saturday afternoon. And she was already, by the way, a fierce reformer who had just become a, a, a crash course on fire safety as another one of the long line of progressive reforms she was pushing. Her name was Frances Perkins. And when she heard the fire bells on the screen, she rushed over to Washington Square, and she stood there in shocked horror watching flaming bodies fall 10 stories to the sidewalk in front of her. Well, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire might have gone down simply as another one of those long lines of tragedies befalling American workers in a time, actually more than a century ago, when economic powers were allowed to simply pursue their own narrow interests with scant regard for the public good. This did not happen this time for what seems to have been two main reasons. One having to do with people like Francis Perkins and the other having to do with Tammany Hall. Once New Yorkers had identified the bodies, they held mass meetings to see if they could make sure that tragedies like that would never happen again. But they had held mass meetings after tragedies before and they did happen again. And initially it looked as if the same pattern of studied negligence would happen again this time. Blank and Harris were given a big trial. They hired very wealthy attorneys and in the end they were exonerated. They were never convicted for negligence. The insurance companies paid off their losses and they were soon back to work. What made this tragedy different, argues one historian, was the action and attitude of Perkins and some of her fellow reformers. Rather than confine themselves to high heel and indignation at the manufacturers and their friends in city government, and rather than use the tragedy as fuel for another great crusade at Tammany Hall, Perkins got to know some of Tammany's key leaders and tried to work with them. Now these were very different people. They were not graduates of Harvard and Mount Holyoke, like Perkins and her blue blood friends. These were tough, street educated politicians from the sidewalks of New York. In particular, Perkins got to know two of these Albany legislators, guys so deeply imbued in the whole culture and corruption of Tammany Hall that the newspapers referred to them as the Tammany Twins. And uh, one of them was named Robert Wagner and the other was named Al Smith. Well, a few weeks after the fire, Perkins went to see Smith in his office there in Albany. And he was polite, she remembered later, but but uh, he gave her what she later recalled as she said, some of the best, best advice I ever got. He said, if you want to change the conditions that led to the Triangle Shirtwaist fire, he said, then forget about this high-toned official safety committee that you and your progressive reformer friends are pushing. You can only change, you can only change those conditions by changing the laws. And you can't do that, he said, without grasping the hand of politics, unquote. Quit looking down your nose at us grubby politicians and work with us. Well, that was a major reason why great, that why great good instead of numbing tragedy came out of the Triangle Shirtwaist fire. And the other reason that it did, historians tell us, is that Tammany Hall embraced the cause of reform. And they can't tell us why. Uh, Tammany Hall boss Charlie Murphy was, was a man so taciturn they called him Silent Charlie. He left very few written records. But we do know that he instructed the state's Democratic governor, John Dix, to create an official and factory, factory investigating commission of the legislature, and he put Wagner and Smith in charge of it. The commission then hired Perkins and many of her reformers' friends as staffers, and in the next few years, the Factory Investigation Commission revolutionized working conditions in the state of New York. They held hearings in 45 cities across the state. They produced thousands of pages of testimony. Perkins led Albany legislators to one factory where 300 workers had access to one single toilet and to another factory where children as young as six years old labored next to their mothers. How long is the workday here, the commissioners asked. Until the kids pass out from exhaustion, came the reply. In the single year of 1912, Wagner and Smith pushed 25 separate workplace safety laws for the legislature. And the reform push percolated in New York City for the next 20 years, culminating when Smith himself became governor of New York and his aggressive advocacy on behalf of workplace safety became a model for other states. You, you grasp the hand of politics. That's how you get that done. Now, if you recognize, and some of you know where this is going, you recognize names like Perkins and, and Smith and Wagner, then you have a, a hunch about where the story goes next. Early on in her career as a young progressive reformer in New York City, Perkins befriended a, a silk-stocking wealthy young state senator from upstate, from, from 
from the Hudson River from Hyde Park. He was a prig, she said. He was snotty. He mostly uh, uh, ran around attacking Tammany Hall and playing for headlines. And he hadn't shown any interest in reform or in working people. And his name, of course, you know this name, Franklin Roosevelt. And as it turned out, the model of reform provided by people like Perkins Smith and Wagner would awaken his interest, help awaken his interest in social justice. And of course, 1928, he would succeed Smith as the reform governor of New York there at the onset of the Great Depression. And four years later, of course, he'd be elected president of the United States and would usher in the next great program of political reform called the New Deal. And one of the most important accomplishments of the New Deal would be a, the National Labor Relations Act, Labor's Magna Carta, which fundamentally, for the first time in US history, gave labor a place at the national table. It didn't say management, of course, had to give in to unions, but it said you had to negotiate with them in good faith. And people had a fundamental right to collective bargaining. And the National Labor Act is, is better known by the great champion of organized labor who pushed it through the Senate, Robert Wagner. And finally, one more little coda to the story. The, the um, cabinet official that Roosevelt told that we have to build a country where, where no one's left out, he told that to his Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins. Well, that's a great story, I think, for a variety of reasons. And it offers at least two good lessons for us Americans Today, it showed, for one, that ordinary Americans acting together can change the inherited modes of power and privilege in their society and protect the common good. And the secondly, the story of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire reminds us that there is a larger common good, bigger than the mere aggregation of all our individual self-interests, though protecting that good means we sometimes have to grasp the hand of politics. All right, so fine, fine. And you're sitting here, this is a nice little history lesson. We paid this guy all this way to come here and tell us history stories. And I'm here delivering the Mennonite Simons lectures. I'm here in one of the great intellectual hotbeds of the Mennonites in the Southern Plains at Bethel College. And I have to ask, not only does, what does it have, what, what's the point of this, but what does it have to do with us Mennonites? And what do Mennonites have to do with politics? Well, there are two answers to this question. There's the, there's the more recent regional answer, and there's the longer answer. And if we're talking about the recent regional answer, then the answer is a lot. Mennonites have had a lot to do with politics if we look at it through recent regional Mennonite history. But if we look at the largest sweep of Mennonite history, the answer is not much. Now, there's been a lot of good work done on the issue of Mennonites in politics, particularly in places like, uh, places like here at Bethel, and particularly in the hands of, of Jim Youngke. I don't need to, to summarize Jim's work on this point. He's around here all the time, and I know he can give his own lectures. He's quite capable of doing that. And I've learned a good deal uh, from him over the years, and especially now recently. And I've learned enough to know that the political career of someone like Dwayne Gosen was not an isolated anomaly, that there is a rich history of Kansas Mennonite politicians across the political spectrum, from Ernie Unruh and Sprig Garber, through Jim Gilmore, and now more recently to activists like Harold Dick, Jesse Harder, Donna Neufeld, and Dwayne Gosen. You can tell I, I read Jim's book this fall, right? And they've repeatedly turned to politics to safeguard the national good. So there is this heritage here in Kansas spread over the past 50 years. But if we turn from the past half century and from here in Kansas to the, to the larger view of Mennonite political activity in particular and their intention and ability to contribute to the common good more broadly, then the answer is, is more ambiguous. So I'll run through a quick little survey of Mennonites in politics over the long view, which means, of course, I'll, I'll wave here at least briefly at the Anabaptists. And there's a good deal of historical ambiguity about how socially and politically withdrawn they really were. On the one hand, there's evidence suggesting that for reasons that were both theological and pragmatic, like the fact, for instance, that the authoritarian states of their day were putting them to death in large numbers, the Anabaptists kept their distance from both their states and their societies. One very influential scholar famously declared in 1944, for example, that, quote, since the Christian may in no circumstance participate in any conduct in the existing social order, which is contrary to the spirit and teaching of Christ, he must consequently withdraw from the worldly system and create a Christian social order within the fellowship of the church brotherhood. Now, you're not seeing my footnotes, but the source itself is telling, and some of you could recognize it. That's Harold Bender in his famous Anabaptist vision statement. On the other hand, 
as Gerald Mass and others have explored, and a Baptist tended, says Gerald, to accord a more decisive social and political witness rather than to quietism. In new research that it's actually uh, Mark Jansen and I heard at Grable last spring, in last June in this um, wonderful conference we attended, Hans Peter Jacker has recently uncovered a number of Anabaptist surgeons, midwives, and barbers whose Christian commitments led them to minister to their sick neighbors and play positive and important roles in their communities, even at the risk of their lives. At any rate, a traditional Anabaptist antipathy towards politics began to erode rather quickly. Less than a century later, Dutch Mennonites were holding local political offices, a practice that even Menno Simons seemed to think permissible. When they later crossed the Atlantic, North Mennonite descendants of these Anabaptists brought the same ambiguous attitudes towards political and social responsibility with them. And even a brief survey like this needs to be careful about which Mennonites I am talking about. For simplicity's sake, I'll just utilize the scheme that, that people like Jim Yonke and Leo Dreger and J. Howard Kaufman have put forward, a, the, in which they differentiate between, they said it's a bipolar mosaic differentiating between a swift South German stream of Mennonites in the 17th century Pennsylvania and later a Dutch North German stream that brought a large flood of immigrants in the 1870s from Mennonite colonies in Ukraine uh, to, to the U.S. Southern Plains. I think here I'm talking about many of your ancestors, right, those folks. And these two different streams brought with them different attitudes towards political and social engagement. Because of the relative autonomy they had enjoyed from the Russian government in Ukraine, the Dutch Russians were much more comfortable with political activity. The Mennonite Commonwealth in Ukraine even sent their own politicians to represent them in the Russian Duma. And when they arrived here in the United States in the 1870s, your ancestors, of course, did this with strong institutional proclivities, a greater pattern of involvement with outside society, and a much more pronounced in-group orientation based on a shared folk culture and a low German dialect. And not surprisingly, their descendants proved deft institution builders, Bethel College is a good example, and their periodic forays into Kansas politics built from that historical trajectory. But it's with this first migration stream, the Swiss, Swiss South German stream where the political ambiguity produced the most tension. On the one hand, the residue of political and social engagement stemming back, stemming back to Anabaptist days had not entirely vanished. Mennonites in Pennsylvania in conjunction with Quaker neighbors, seem to have been involved in electoral politics, at least up through the American Revolution. On the other hand, these Mennonites arrived in 18th century North America with deep patterns of isolation that was both socio-cultural and also theological. It's among these Mennonites that John Redekop observed where, quote, non-participation in gov government became the official norm at least until the 19th century. And this pattern seems to have held sway into the next century as well. Exceptions may have been made for individual Mennonites and especially some leaders, but most official Mennonite conference bodies, Redekop pointed out, continued to hold official statements against explicit political involvement through the early 20th century. And of course, we have to further then ask why. The answer seems to be two-pronged. Mennonite wariness of explicit political involvement emanated both from their traditional socio-cultural isolation and also, of course, from their two-kingdom theology that came expressed in their traditional stance of non-resistance. And I think we all know what non-resistance meant. You take your bearings from Romans 13, where Paul declares that God has established a state to keep order in the wicked world. And most Christian groups have developed some kind of two-kingdom theology. It's not a Mennonite project, but most envision the two realms of church and state positively, with the Christian enjoined to operate fully in both and with very few grounds of conflict between them. Mennonites would have envisioned these postures differently, shaped by an historical legacy in which tyrannical states had put their ancestors to death in large numbers, traditional Mennonite non-resistance built from a wide gap, expressed, expressed both in theology and mapped out in actual practice between these two realms of church and state. And as long as the state did not ask them to violate their higher obligation to God's kingdom, Non-resistance required Mennonites to obey its directives quite submissively. Most of what the state did was none of their business. So they did not serve as magistrates, police officers, politicians, lawyers, or members of labor unions. Traditionally, Mennonites were, relu were reluctant to prescribe any course of conduct to the state. Many showed a reluctance even to vote. And look, folks, look, I know I'm generalizing broadly here, 
And uh, given what I just said a few moments ago, these strictures of traditional non-resistance were not watertight and were often disobeyed in actual practice. They began to break down in the early 20th century and they were held onto tightest in the swift South German stream, of course, as opposed to the Dutch-Russian one. And having said that, it's also important to recognize that traditional non-resistance was also maintained by GC Mennonites at least through the mid 20th century. The GC Mennonite leader Henry P. Crabill, for example, had served a term in the Kansas legislature and clearly had no aversion to electoral politics. But as he worked with other pacifists in the 1920s and 1930s, he rejected their approaches as too political and called instead for personal transformation as the way to change society. You know, I spent a lot of time at one point reading, uh, reading GC records through the Vietnam War. I read uh, the Mennonite, uh, I read every issue of the Mennonite. I spent a lot of time in grad school, this is what you do. And I um, uh, spent a lot of time reading the papers of people like Stan Bone and the Peace and Social Concerns Commission in the mid-60s. Mid and uh, you know, you heard plenty of this Two Kingdom stuff come from GC pastors across the Southern Plains. I'll just give you one example. The, the, the Peace and Social Concerns Commission, Committee uh, asked congregations to express their dissent uh, against the Vietnam War, right? The right Congress and dissent from the war. And this is what one pastor wrote. We do not feel it to be a function of the church to dictate to the United States what course of action they should take. And I can tell the state what to do. Well, one of the Reasons that traditional non-resistance held on as long as it did, my example here notwithstanding, and that Mennonite adherence to it began to crumble when it did, had to do with the relative Mennonite distance from society. Unvarnished two kingdom theology made sense when Mennonites could keep these two realms of church and state far apart. And for centuries they were able to do this through all these boundary maintenance mechanisms, a separate German language and culture, particularly here in the Southern Plains, and Mennonite physical location on isolated farms and a devotion to rural agriculture and a theology of nonconformity that branded outside cultural intrusions as worldly and sinful. So as I'll explore with the Bethel students tomorrow morning, as the pace of the Mennonite acculturation intensified, as it did in the first decades of the 20th century, those barriers began to disintegrate. And thus it was, by the World War II years, and that's not a coincidence given how the war itself served as a great acculturating agent, and that a key Mennonite church leader, and that's also no coincidence, produced a seminal theological historical statement that reinforced traditional non-resistance, but also adapted it to fit new circumstances. And this here, of course, I have to, we have to deal with Guy Hirschberger's classic framing of non-resistance, war, peace, and non-resistance. And in it, Hirschberger wrestled essentially with the material I'm wrestling with in these lectures, Mennonite answers to the problems of injustice, and the extent to which they accepted a sense of social responsibility. Look, what Hirschberger was a, 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 a remarkably productive reader and writer, and it's not easy to summarize him. Uh, the task has been, been rendered slightly easier by Theron Slobak's magnificent, he wrote a magnificent biography of Guy Hirschberger. I mean, it's a masterpiece. Theron is such, I mean, he's such a giant of scholarship. And it's hard for me to disagree with Theron Schlaubach, God help me, right? He is, uh, the, 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 the subtlety and nuance of Hirschberger's thought that Dr. Schlaubach explored in that text is remarkable. He's a, he is a giant of scholarship. And he made clear what any careful reading of Hirschberger makes clear, that Hirschberger himself was a complex, careful, nuanced thinker. He was somebody, someone deeply concerned about the problems of injustice, someone determined to nudge his church into activism on issues, on those kinds of issues, despite effective and determined opposition from his church's fundamentalist wing. Well, so it was clear to Hirschberger what the Mennonites could not do. They could not, he said, and this is 1944, they could not participate in politics. He built from a ringing affirmation of two kingdom theology. The outlook of the New Testament is entirely apolitical, he taught. I'm quoting him, and so were the early Anabaptists. The scriptures, he told Mennonites, have, quote, nothing to say about how affairs of state should be conducted, unquote. Nor could Mennonites conscientiously engage in the struggle against injustice through nonviolent action, a prospect that Hirschberg then regarded with horror. He spent long pages detailing how nonviolent coercion was still coercion, and thus the non-resistant Christian should have nothing to do. We can't do nonviolence, he said, even after he embraced King. Uh, 
and brought him to Goshen and uh, looked with such power on the civil rights movement and did his best to push Mennonites into activism on the civil rights struggle. I mean, in a remarkably prophetic, courageous way, he still would not admit he changed his mind. Non-resistant Christians, he said, should simply do justice and not demand. That's his famous formulation. Just do justice. Mennonites were certainly involved in the social problems of the day, he said, but would approach them, quote, with a different technique through regeneration and discipleship rather than, rather than through education and reformation. The mission of non-resistant Christians is therefore not a political one, he argued. Instead, it was a curative one. Hirschberger located the Mennonite answer to injustice in the formation of socially engaged alternative communities that would simply flesh out God's way of love in a conflict-ridden world. In a later phrase that he came to cherish, he said Mennonites would achieve justice simply by serving as, the phrase was, colonies of heaven. We'd be colonies of heaven. And then, in a decade of persistent activism with allies like the GC sociologist and Bethel prof Winfield Fretz, he would work to flesh out that vision, preaching, preaching a reinforcement of Mennonite rural life. Look, it was, it was a powerful and persuasive vision that seemed to set the parameters of Mennonite thinking on these issues for a generation or more. Writers in the Mennonite Encyclopedia argued that Hirschberger's war, peace, and armor resistance function as, quote, a foundational peace theology for all the major Mennonite bodies in North America, unquote. Leo Dridger, Don Crable, Paul Taves affirmed it as a, quote, conceptual triumph. Schlaubach has summarized how Hirschberger's arguments came to assume a kind of a paradigmatic paradigmatic influence on Mennonite thought on his own day and hours. He actually singled me out as a premier voice in this chorus of scholarly affirmation. Well, two decades later, I'm not so sure. I still very much agree with Farron and others as the centrality of Hirschberger's arguments in mid-20th century Mennonite thinking about matters of justice and social responsibility. I would insist today, as I stressed 20 years ago and will outline to the Bethel students tomorrow, the signal importance of little prophetic qualifier that Hirschberger tucked into his arguments that in the end undermined his entire dualistic two kingdom understandings. And I don't think it's necessary here for me to spend three lectures outlining a trend that a number of scholars, including myself, have outlined in detail the Mennonite insistence in recent decades in intertwining their calls to peacemaking with the demands for justice. The titles of some recently well-regarded texts are instructive in themselves. Mennonite Peacemaking from Quietism to Activism or Urban Stutzman's book, Non-Resistance to Justice. The word justice, starting to some degree with Hirschberger and partly because of him, has entered the Mennonite vocabulary since the 60s. But in these lectures, I just have a few more modest aims. All I want to do is lay out alternative voices that challenge this consensus, even as it was being fully formed by MC leaders like Hirschberger and Bender in the decades of the 20th century. And my argument tonight and tomorrow is just this. Mennonites, from a variety of perspectives in these years, and one ally in a sister tradition, did not accept these two kingdom understandings uncritically. They began speaking to Mennonites' social and political involvement decades before Mennonites more fully grasped the justice imperative in the 1960s and beyond. And with the rest of my time tonight, I'll just give you one such voice, pushing this alternative perspective. I'm going to bring in uh, C. Henry Smith. There has been a new book out about Smith that uh, I found useful. And uh, I, just, I just have time for the briefest biographical introductions. Smith was born in 1875 to an Amish family in central Illinois, right about the time when the Amish themselves were beginning to split into the old order Amish and a more cultured group called the Amish Mennonites. Uh, his father, John Smith, became a bishop in the local Amish Mennonite Conference and led the way in adapting innovations like Sunday schools, revivalism, and education. And with that background, Smith spent his adolescent and adult life on the far progressive edge of the Mennonite world, primarily through his role as a leading Mennonite educator. He received his doctorate degree in history from the University of Chicago in 1907, and first with teaching at the newly reformed Goshen College. In 1913, he transferred from Goshen to the newly redesigned Bluffton College where he taught until his retirement in 46. While he didn't use this language, Smith repeatedly and consistently argued that Mennonites could and should contribute to the public good. This was a thrust that their entire history had prepared them to do. He pushed this agenda in several ways. First, as the leading Mennonite historian of his era, 
the author of half a dozen major books and upwards of 80 articles in the Mennonite lay press. Smith laid out a usable past for Mennonites that he designed to speak to the problems of their day. Mennonites, he said, were the inheritors of foundational principles of Western civilization, passed down to them from Anabaptist ancestors like freedom of conscience, church state separation, and a basic commitment to Christian peacemaking. And it was their job to share those commitments with larger society. That message permeated the entire corpus of his work from his earliest writings until his death in 1948. Um, I'm going to skip a paragraph here because I am cognizant of the time, but it's, it's, it's interlaced throughout his work. That was his agenda. And look, I, I am eager to acknowledge that it had flaws. You know, it's funny, you know, you read that book, it is so, I, you read his work, and it's so laced with ironies. You know, what are the ironies? That um, both the Mennonite progressives and their fundamentalist opposition were both positioning themselves as the great arbiters of normative Mennonitism, right, and accusing the other side of borrowing, and they were doing this, both of them, on the basis of arguments they themselves had borrowed from the outside, right? So Smith was borrowing uncritically from mainstream American progressivism. And his adversaries, people who became his adversaries, were also borrowing from an outside current called, uh, I don't know what else to call it, the main, but Protestant fundamentalism. And both of those currents enriched the Mennonite world, but both of them were borrowing. Right? I know we can't imagine that today. People borrowing from the outside in order to talk about their problems, but that's what Mennonites did 80 years ago. And, um, and look, the, the borrowing was problematic. Smith adopted way too much. He, he adopted, I mean, mainstream American progressivism was, was profoundly racist, and Smith certainly reflected that in some of his early writing. And he did not shed that racism and that civil religion until middle age when he began writing about the, quote, unchristian nature of racism. He actually uh, toured Germany with Harold Bender in 1936 after the Manette World Conference and was struck dumb by the level of anti-Semitism he saw operating in rural Germany. Um, and so, but he, you know, he mapped out this deal between Mennonites and larger society that in exchange for full inclusion, he said, Mennonites could usher the American mainstream to a greater acceptance of these foundational principles that they themselves had pioneered, and that was shattered by the First World War. And the wartime persecutions vi visited onto his people by, pro by American progressives clearly struck a, 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 worked a deep transition in Smith's thought. Not long in the 1920s, he dropped his faith in the goodwill of a beneficent American state. He began to regard American acculturate, a Mennonite acculturation in a much more critical eye. And he was soon warning his fellow Mennonites of the, quote, disintegrating influence of the changing social and economic order. But even so, I mean, you have to acknowledge the flaws, and it's a good thing to reflect on too much uncritical borrowing. But even so, his creation of a usable past worked marvelous effects in both inward and outward directions. Inwardly, it profoundly advanced the Mennonite historical renaissance then underway in the interwar years. Harold Bender was not its only father. Smith visited Anabaptist historical sites in Europe. He serialized his adventures in the Mennonite. He published extensively in the lay press on Anabaptist Mennonite history, and he worked in GC circles to expand the Mennonite historical consciousness. But he aimed his scholarship at a different end than Bender. Rather than remaining apart from other Americans and creating what Paul Taves summarized as, quote, a distinctive Christian social order, Smith in instead called Mennonites to engage fellow Americans with their ideas. Rather than creating an alternative model for others to follow, Smith urged his fellow Mennonites to share with their society the values they had been gifted with from their history and which it so desperately needed. And perhaps it's easy for us today to lose sight of the potentialities of those kind of contributions. Those of us ingrained in a Mennonite church today, you know, we are quite aware of its problems. We know, for instance, of our aging congregations, of our, the poor retention rates of our youth, of the struggles of our educational institutions. We may be locked now today into another great era of Mennonite schism as congregation after congregation, conference after conference, detaches itself from the larger fellowship and makes a mockery of our poor Mennonite our latest efforts at union. In the midst of this, sometimes it takes outsiders, Stuart Murray is a good example, to remind us how exciting others may yet still find us. 
Once we let the walls down and share our ideas, there might continue to be a dynamism to our various Anabaptist visions that persists sometimes in spite of ourselves. And one of the reasons others may still find this exciting may go back to people like Smith and the role he created for his church, the role of the Mennonite public intellectual, someone deeply engaged with the ideas and political movements of his time. Again, uh, this worked in inwards and outward direction. He published 80-some articles in Mennonite lay press on all sorts of stuff. Thomas Malthus, demographic projections, the germ theory of disease, Marxist economic determinism. At the same time, he, he showed the public activism that could emanate out of that kind of intellectual engagement. He founded not one but two local banks. He emerged into a widespread and widely respected civic leader and pillar of Main Street in, in Bluffton. He served a term in the village council. He had served a term in the local school board. He served as a delegate to 1932 uh, Ohio State Democratic Party Convention in Columbus. He traveled widely across Europe, the Pacific, and Mexico. He sat in seminars with major world and national leaders in the mid-1920s with the presidents of Germany and Czechoslovakia. He picnicked with Stanley Baldwin in his backyard at number 10 Downing Street. In the mid-1930s, he met with the leading lights of the New Deal, including one session with Franklin Roosevelt. And through it all, he modeled another capacity of the public intellectual, the capacity to change one's mind. This was seen not only in his, again, belated rejection of racism, but also in his political shifts. By the 1940s, 1940, he clearly had broken with the New Deal. He was campaigning for, Woodger, for, for Wendell Wilkie for president. And of course, he didn't do this alone. The Mennonite landscape of the time harbored a number, a number of bright intellectuals. There was an active collection here at Bethel with people like Edmund Coughlin and Emmett Harshbarger, who certainly pushed the, Medding, pushed the cutting edge of Mennonite social and political engagement in GC circles in the Southern Plains. Harshbarger and Coughlin, and later Winfield Fretz, were, were Smith students. And um, he kept in close touch with them. And they certainly regarded their old professor as their mentor and a model. Further east of the, on the Mississippi, one thinks of Bender, Hirschberger, and Edward Yoder at Goshen, of Ori Miller at Lancaster. But the forces of MC fundamentalism at the time severely limited their public associations with anyone outside of conservative circles or even much public expression of conservative ideals. Smith was not bound by those kinds of strictures. He was an intensely public intellectual. You know, what I, I worked through 60 boxes of his papers, and one of the most interesting boxes I found was he, what he'd do is he'd take an 8 and a half by 11 piece of paper, and he, would, and he would cut it in half, and he would insert in his typewriter, and he would pound out speech outlines, bullet points. And you know, you don't understand what he's referring to until you break the code. And you, you see what these, little, what these little words meant. And then you, you tally them up, and what you found, what I found was an incredibly busy and active public speaker. I found about 110 outlines, speech outlines, between the early 30s and through the end of the war. That's eight to 10 a year. And he was speaking, of course, to Mennonite groups, Sunday schools and church conventions and youth conventions and, and uh, ministerial associations. And he crisscrossed the Mennonite landscape from eastern Ohio to Iowa, treating audiences to a variety of themes. He was focused on Mennonite history, but he was really, you know, he was pushing, he was pushing the Mennonite seminary. He said, without a Mennonite seminary, we're doomed, we're doomed. What especially struck me was how he was speaking to non-Mennonite groups, civic groups, high school commencements, ministerial associations. He even had, for two years on the eve of World War II, a, a, a radio program. And in those, it wasn't, it wasn't bullet point outlines. It was whole transcripts of what he said on the radio. I mean, it was a whole thing, typed out. So he's talking about Russian foreign policy and Japan policy in the Far East. He, um, uh, in November of 1941, he said that the Japan attack, the Japanese attack is clearly coming. I'll just give you one example. He, he was, a, he was this, is, this is November of 39. He was asked to uh, speak to a, the State Baptist Youth Convention in Lima. And um, uh, he's a little you know, local professor and lead discussions among the State Baptist High School Youth meeting in Lima, our county seat. And um, he said, you know, you got the outline. And he says, okay, I know you're Baptists and we're Anabaptists, but we all come from the same people. We come from Menno Simons. And so here's what Menno Simons said about war, right? And he, and, he, and, he, and he held up the absolute objectives of World War I as the great heroes of our time. That's what he's told the state Baptist youth in 1939. So I need to draw this to a close. 
We have become a more decent and just society through a great many ways, from people descending publicly from wrong, uh, for example, and by people doing the works of mercy. I agree with Hirschberger and Bender. They are right. The church contributes a great deal to society just by being the church. But not only that. Even as people like Bender and Hirschberger put together what many seem came to regard as the definitive Mennonite answer to the problem of injustice, there were others in the church mapping out a different answer. There were alternative models available then about how Mennonites could contribute to the common good. And these models raised good questions for us today. Not just about what this Mennonite silence and political disengagement uh, cost. Right? But what it's, not, not, not just what it, what it did for Mennonites, but what it cost. Look, those, that disengagement and that silence, those walls had benefits. And I talked about those, those benefits at, at, at Bethel College Mennonite Church this morning. But we also have to acknowledge what that disengagement cost Mennonites and what it cost others. And these are matters I'll be exploring tomorrow with the students and then tomorrow night here with you. But I'm going to leave time now for questions and comments. Thank you very much. I promise any answer will be less long-winded. <laughs> Who was uh, Smith's uh, main mentor in uh, uh, before before the war? In, in, uh, in, who taught him progressive idealism well, Jimmy, from outside the Mennonite? He learned it in grad school. You know, he did his doctorate in North Chicago under E. Franklin Jameson, who was one of the great barons of the American Historical Association. Jameson, of course, founded the American Historical Association, founded the American Historical Review. And I spent a lot of time in the book talking about the great, you know, what, what uh, Charles Beard called the noble dream, that noble dream of objectivity. And Smith adopted wholesale this great dream of empiricism, right, in which you simply uh, accumulate the facts and um, uh, tell what the facts express to you. And that was a, an ideal that he took to heart. It was the reigning scholarly model in history at the turn of the century. And it wasn't until the 30s and 40s when, when, men, when historians across the board began to move to more relativistic understandings. And he himself slightly shifted. But he also, as part of that, clearly embraced the entire um, um, progressive project. One of his professors was a guy named C. Charles Merriam, who was uh, um, a political scientist at Chicago and later on became a forum candidate for mayor of New York. He had campaigned for Seth Lowe in New York City. And um, uh, Merriam particularly seemed to model for Smith the kind of uh, epitome of the engaged social scientist. You know, So when Smith later got involved in um, the, the, uh, the Prohibition Crusade at Goshen. Um, I do a little dig, and I spent some time with the Goshen Daily News on microfilm in 1910, 1911, 1912, and discovered that there was a profoundly powerful local option campaign there in Elkhart County, and Smith and Byers were key figures in it. Smith led the dry forces, right? But, but he was such an interesting social scientist that I couldn't tell what side he was on, because you'd come across reams of stuff, details on the drink bill and the cost of alcohol and the, and the liquor industry. And it wasn't until I found in one of the folders a little flyer by the, basically the Dry Force Executive Committee and the head of the Dry Force Executive Committee was C.H. Smith. Well, he was borrowing from people like uh, C. Charles Merriam, right? And, um, and by the way, C. Charles Merriam, when he, when he, um, when he ran, oh, excuse me, his name was Charles Edward Merriam. That's how I got that wrong. When he ran for um, 
when he ran for the mayor of New York, I read, I read a biography of Miriam. And when he ran for mayor of New York, he called himself C. Charles Miriam, C. C. Edward Miriam, excuse me. And his campaign manager said, drop the C. It makes you look too much like a professor, right? <laughs> so so there, you know, C, C stands for nothing, right? It was a little thing that this Amish teenager named Henry Smith attached to his name because he thought it made him, well, it's just what you did. It was like a Gilded Age tattoo. And he could never get rid of it, right? And so um, later on in life, when he, when he, he travels, um, officials want to know what does the C stand for, and he can't explain what it stands for. It stood for nothing, right? So there may have been, even as a teenager, when he calls himself C, I'm on a tangent here, <laughs> and I promised my answer would be less long-winded, but, but um, it may have been, it may have had some air of professorial erudition, you know, even as an Amish teenager, um, when, when, when bureaucrats wouldn't accept that it, it stood for nothing, they, they had named him. So um, officials at University of Illinois where he studied called him, they christened him Charles. And US State Department officials, it says it on his passport, he was Cecil. So every time he traveled across you know, Europe, he had to sign his name, Cecil Henry Smith. <coughs> yes. Uh, coming to your two examples, uh, would you say that Hirschberger's message really resonated across the Mennonite spectrum or mainly in the old Mennonites? Oh, w or, and uh, Smith, did he resonate across the spectrum or was he mostly speaking to general conference Mennonites? I'm wondering whether they were well, <laughs> sort of compartmentalized and they, you know, with Mennonite brethren and, and we have those out here and you haven't talked about those yet, but anyhow, I'm just wondering how widely were these intellectuals and their message getting across to people outside their own circle? Well, Bender and Horst corresponded at various points about producing another Mennonite history tome to, to get so they could supplant Smith's, right? Get rid of Smith's. His book, you know, basically what he did was rewrite the same book like four times. You know, his dissertation became the 1920s book, the 1920s book, the 1941 book, and there are huge, huge chunks of those books that are exactly the same. He just cut and pasted, right? But, and amplified and made it bigger. Um, and the MC Mennonites never did produce a, a, a different text. They weren't happy with Smith's text, but they never did get rid of it. And apparently it was used. Uh, someone wrote Smith. Who was it? John Umble? wrote Smith in the 40s that Bender was using Smith's 1941 book in his classes. And, um, you know, you did that work. Keith, I, your stuff was so helpful to me. You interviewed, you interview Faith and Life in the 1980s, and it was still in print, and it was especially being used in Canada. And for many Mennonites where I, well, I suspect many of you, right? And many beloved Mennonites, for some of you, that would have been the work by which you would have learned Mennonite history. To what degree did it did it um, permeate uh, MC circles? Well, again, they couldn't produce a rival text. John Horsch produced one in the Mennonites of Europe. When was that? Right before he died. Late 30s, the Mennonites of Europe. But they didn't produce a overall summary text. Now, um, how much did Bender influence GC Mennonites? Um, Farron explores that nuance of Hirschberger's thought, thought in exhaustive detail. And, I like Theron explored everything in exhaustion, unbelievable uh, nuanced scholarship. Remarkable, it's a remarkable book. Um, uh, he said, he's got that, well, Donovan Smooker gave it a glowing review, right? War, Peace, and Non-Resistance. And he said there were some grumbling in GC circles that he picked up, that, that Hershberger picked up, that he was downplaying Mennonite activism. Um, I don't know. I, I think Theron's right that I think that two kingdom stuff and some of, you know, who am I? Some outsider? I mean, you all here at Bethel, I, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to say this in front of you. My sense is that Hirschberger's formulations took hold out here. And, you know, I read you what the folks in my encyclopedia said, what Dredger and Coffin said. They seem to think that it, that it had deep resonance, right? And uh, the two kingdom theology wasn't merely confined to the MC folks. But I mean, is that, what do you think? Do you disagree with me? I am here I am talking to Bethel academics and intellectuals. Am I all wet here? I mean, you grew up in this world. I, just, I grew up in LA. I didn't know Mennonites were Mormons until I was in grad school. 
I mean, one had lots of wives and one did not. I, you know, I, I couldn't keep them straight. Um, you tell me. Am I, am I out of line? I don't mean this rhetorically. I'm curious to your, as to your responses. I, I'm, I don't have a, a good answer to the overall question of influence. But uh, during, I found in my own uh, family, my uncle Walt and my father Bill, mm -hmm. uh, Bill wasn't drafted and wasn't in CPS. Walt was drafted and was in CPS and quite anguished about uh, the compromises yeah. of, uh, of yeah. becoming involved. Yeah, and uh, uh, those two had an important correspondence back and, and back and forth, these two brothers. Oh, yeah. and, and Bill wrote to Walt, you know, before, Walt actually set a date by which, unless he received further insight, he was going to leave CPS, go home and wait for the authorities to pick him up and put him in prison. And, uh, and Bill wrote to him and said, before you do that, you should read the book by, C, by uh, Guy F. Hirschberger. Oh, is that right? Uh, so that's, that's one case of influence in a particular family. I'm going to spend some time, if I can talk fast enough, I'm 35 minutes, we'll do this tomorrow. Um, I'll have three cups of coffee. Um, uh, I'm going to spend a little time, I think, talking about these conscription institutes in the Second World War, that uh, there were enough people like your Uncle Walt who were talking that way, that Bender had to go out in the CPS camps to nip that thinking in the bud. And they, they weren't, they, they weren't, Mennonites didn't walk out like the Quakers were doing, but they were people on the edge, and they pushed him hard. And somewhere in deep buried in the Goshen archives, I found a private report that one of, they would have these bull sessions, they call them, in the barracks at night. And one guy took notes. I don't think he was an informer. I think he was part of these things. And he, that got back to, to, well, it's in the archives of Goshen. And I cited it. I found it. It's remarkable. They, they sat there refuting that two kingdom stuff, right? Right down the line. What are you even doing in a barracks, they said. Now, they didn't walk out. But that anguish, Jim, that you're talking about, I mean, well, you know, there was a note from Melvin Gingrich, I think, the Hirschberger accompanying some of these letters. And I, you know, I found them there, and I found them in Lancaster, right? Amos Horst, you know, who, who was one of you know, Bender's right-hand bishops there in Lancaster. Amos Horst, does that mean you know? Lancaster bishop on the Peace Problems Committee. Horst says we shouldn't have done this. We should have gone to Canada. We should go to jail. And Harold Bender says, well, Amos, what are you talking about? Right? And, and Gingrich wrote to Hirschberger, and he said, and I, I, I got it in the book, in my first book. He said, you know, I'm convinced that these letters speak to a deep underlying unease about CPS, that, that we can't just dismiss this as too close, a product of too much fraternization with the Quakers, that this was coming out of our tradition, right? And part of that's because these guys, A, these were big, well, whose, whose phrase was that? Yours, Keith, Paul Taves, Paul Taves, Mennonite melting pots, wasn't my phrase, these CPS camps. Right? Men like melting pots, and they did not want to be separated. They, they liked being all together, liked hearing from others. And you know who was coming through? Winston Dances came through. Bayard Rustin came through those camps. You know, I mean, they were great educational institutions, not just for the Mennonite Heritage Series. There was that. But outsiders were. And they, they were learning a lot, and their eyes were being opened to its injustice. Of course, this is, I'm giving them my lecture tomorrow away right here, right? And you know they were becoming conscious of the world's pain and need. These guys were in the deep south, confronting African Americans for the first time, right? And they and, and treating them as human beings. And the Klan tells them to knock it off. Well, you know they come home, Elmer Ediger and Bob Crater and all those people you knew, right? They came home and it changed you all. It changed us. No, I think your uncle Walt was on to something. That's what I think. Yeah, see, I won't answer questions. I'll go on for 20 minutes. That's a problem. <laughs>
Well, thank you all for coming this evening, and you're welcome to come tomorrow evening, and also if you're free during the morning at 11 o'clock for Bethel College Convocation, both here in the same room. And thank you, Perry, for an interesting uh, talk and answering of questions and telling stories, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you.